media likes to remind Americans that each of us descend from families of immigrants. Despite their use of that idea to soften up opposition against open borders, which is ill-founded, that's one of a few things that we collectively get right. In my own family tree, at least one of my English ancestors arrived in the Jamestown colony around 1620. Another of my ancestors was already here. As my late cousin and humorous Will Rogers once said, my people didn't come over on the Mayflower, but they met the boat. Despite the early arrival in southern Appalachia, even the Cherokee are recent immigrants from Canada when they first encountered European settlers. DNA found among the Cherokee leads us back to Mongolia and other parts of Asia. While having distant English and Cherokee ancestors is interesting, those lines do not come close to describing the origins of the bulk of my ancestry and the kind of culture that I absorbed throughout my youth. I imagine that the same can be said for most Americans. Here's another example. According to Lizzie Wade in a 2014 article in Science Magazine, a typical African American is more than 20% Caucasian, but few African Americans embrace a European identity. About 4% of white Americans carry African genes. Interestingly, many whites and blacks do not have any idea that they are biologically connected to each other. Spencer Wells and the geneticist at the National Geographic Society's Geno2 Project tells us that every human being alive is a descendant of a man and woman who lived in East Africa in a place that biblical writers called Ethiopia or ancient Cush. These facts beg the question, are we members of an American melting pot or are we distinct pieces of an American salad bowl? Today on The Vantage Point, we're going to dig a little deeper into the ethnic mosaic that is the American population to see if we can answer that question. I hope you'll join me. In a culturally sensitive world, it's important to correctly use labels for race and ethnicity. Both are distinct social and cultural constructs, but race involves social concepts attached to biological traits that societies use to place people into various groups. Just to be clear, the concepts of melting pot and salad bowl refer to cultural and social distinctives that describe populations of people. To get to the bottom of what we mean by melting pot and salad bowl, we should appreciate that humans have to learn about culture and social relationships. While some cognitive traits and genetic tendencies are more common in specific groups, we are not born seeing the world like an Irishman or an Indonesian. Although we're not born with an awareness of our biological distinctives or race, we learn to think along racial lines. Through social interaction and life experiences, people learn roles and attitudes that they believe define their membership in a particular ethnic group. Still others consciously try to morph themselves into the idealized status of citizen of the world. I found that these folk typically embrace either a leftist political orientation with an eye toward regulating human behavior, or they hope to become leaders in a global capitalist model. Interestingly, it's sometimes claimed that a person has committed cultural appropriation if he or she adopts a behavior or activity more commonly found in another group. Think Eminem and rap music. It's a good thing that there's no real punishment for committing the heinous crime of cultural appropriation. For all of us would be guilty at some level. In that sense, there are some attributes of a melting pot in the West. This notion invites me to think of Americans as a melting pot because it suggests that our cultures have merged together to form a new distinct way of life. On the other hand, social sanctions and living in ethnic enclaves, enclaves keep us in line with the social ideals of our group. In that instance, one can view America as a salad bowl. A salad bowl sees us as members of ethnic groups that maintain distinctive ways of life as well as ways in which we communicate with each other and view the governance of space. America in the 20th century emerged as a multi-ethnic country as millions of immigrants drawn from countries outside of northwestern Europe settled here. Irish Catholics, who often spoke Gaelic, Italians, Russians, and Poles were well represented among the people landing in port cities from 1865 to 1930. Beginning in 1848, there were modest numbers of Chinese immigrants arriving in the country. From colonial times to January 1st, 1808, 
the date after which the importation of slaves into the United States was made illegal, Africans, who were mostly from the west coast around the modern-day country of Nigeria, lived in urban and rural areas across the Deep South. With the rise of industrialism and factory work in the north, many African Americans relocated to newly forming ethnic enclaves in Detroit, Chicago, Buffalo, New York, and Gary, Indiana, among other places. Poor whites from the south, especially Appalachia, also moved to industrial centers in the north. Ypsilanti, Michigan took on the label of Ipsituckee because of the large numbers of transplanted Kentuckians settling there. By 1930, the vast majority of immigrants were, with the exception of Africans and Chinese from countries, that were made up of institutions inspired by historic Christianity. The Chinese typically adhered to Buddhism, Taoism, or Confucianism, so they maintained uh, community and faith-based affiliations. A majority of Chinese immigrants settled into commonly occupied spaces that grew into ethnic enclaves like Chinatown in San Francisco, which was born in 1848, some 13 years before the American Civil War. Immigrant communities that spoke non-Germanic languages and worshipped in Catholic and Eastern Orthodox Christian churches also formed their own ethnic islands. Little Italy and New York began in 1926. Pulaski Township and Hantramck, Michigan were popular with Eastern Europeans, especially Polish immigrants. Beginning with the first wave of Irish Protestants in 1717, they tended to seek out farming opportunities in the farthest reaches of the colonies. By the middle of the 19th century, they had expanded their ethnic island to include central and southern Appalachia, as well as the Ozarks, and into the hill country of Texas. Eastern Woodland Indians, like the Chickasaw, Cherokee, Choctaw, Shawnee, and Seminole, were relocated in the Trail of Tears to Oklahoma in 1838. Today, however, natives in Oklahoma make up less than 10% of the state's population, but the imprint of native cultures is strong in Oklahoma. I once knew some white Oklahomans who, dis with decidedly Scottish and Irish names and freckle face and red hair, had no interest in attending a Scottish Highland Games or a Celtic festival, but they were regular attendees at powwows. I think that Oklahomans prove that ethnicity doesn't have to involve genetics. As we look across the cultural landscape of the American Southwest, it's hard to not notice the imprint of Hispanic cultures in place names like Santa Fe, New Mexico, Las Vegas, New Mexico, El Paso, Texas, and so on. Scattered amongst the Hispanic communities of the region and the further north into the Rockies are a number of large Native American reservations. For instance, at 2,533 square miles, the Hopi Reservation is larger than Delaware or Rhode Island. The Cheyenne River Reservation in South Dakota is larger than Connecticut. When one looks at the American ethnic mosaic, it's easy to think that the population represents a melting pot. But a salad bowl comes to mind when considering newer ethnic islands like the Muslim communities forming in Greater Detroit, Dearborn that is, Minneapolis and Kansas City, among other places. The salad bowl construct is further reinforced when we recognize that older ethnic enclaves like Chinatown and Little Italy, as well as the ethnic islands of Hispanics and Irish Protestants, maintain strong senses of identity and influential political views. As members of American communities, we all have some things in common, mostly our benign aspects of culture like foods and music, but scratch below the surface and we often see differences in how we regard local and national government, the roles of women, acts of the divine, and who can be a member of our community. It's in these deeper aspects of culture that are tied to identity and community pose challenges to governing a diverse population on a national scale. For instance, a proposal for a new law might appeal to one group while alienating another. Until recently, society encouraged a shared sense or feeling of devotion or respect for things like the Mount Rushmore, the Liberty Bell, the American flag, and the national anthem. Those objects symbolized liberty and the pursuit of happiness. They were essential in forging a sense of nationhood. In, their wake, in the wake of their destruction, what will bind the country's diverse communities together? Think about that. In the next vantage point, we'll take a look at what the political landscape of North America might look like if the country were to break apart. I hope you'll join me.